Noah, uh, you know, I, I was in a, a, a pie eating contest one time. And uh, they used to call me two scoops for like a couple of weeks because I ate the whole pie in like two scoops. It was all over my face. I almost threw up. It was bad. What kind of pie was it? <laughs> I can't. It was like blueberry, but it was at a Halloween party. I had makeup on and the cake. I mean, the, a pie was like, yeah, it was it was, it was rough. But Is I won. Uh, that, that, was, that was the natural follow-up. Okay, so it was worth it. Uh, is there, <laughs> two is there any, scoops. Two scoops. Any photographic evidence of this? Or? No, I got rid of that. I got rid of that. I, yeah. I was a little, yeah. Hipper than the Hippopotamus is the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilmu Works, Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, our producer extraordinaire, Ben Barry, in the cut here. And uh, Noah, we have some dates to talk about. Uh, September 26, 10 a.m., media day at Camden at the Sixers practice facility. I'm sure you'll be there. The question is, will you be in South Carolina, Charleston to be specific, the next day when Sixers training camp starts at the Citadel? Are you making the trip to both, Noah? I think that's uh, TBD. I would like to. Okay. Uh, so hopefully uh, I would I would definitely like to make that trip. Um, sounds like it'll be an interesting uh, change of scenery for the Sixers. We know Doc Rivers uh, generally likes to get away for camp. It's not Hawaii like you do with the Clippers, but I think it'll be in nice- Europe. Right? <laughs> or Europe, yeah. Rome, whatever. But uh, He did that a- with the Celtics, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, before their championship season, he uh, led that team on a, a trip through Europe. But I think uh, it'll be neat for the Sixers to get some bonding opportunities uh, just in a new environment. And uh, I'm curious how that all all play out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, September 27th to October 2nd, um, down in Charleston, South Carolina at the Citadel, uh, looking for some team building, some camaraderie. Uh, all these new faces coming into the fold, uh, trying to intermingle with these old faces. And um, as I reflect on it, I, I really hope it achieves the goal that they hope. Um, you outlined in your article on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com that last season they had five days of camp and then one day off. And um, according to Mark Spears, that one day off will likely be spent on some type of uh, – historical uh, 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 tasks that they're going to take on uh, while down there in Charleston, um, maybe learning about the uh, Gullah culture down there and um, maybe some type of historical slave museum or something of that sort. Um, how, where you stand on, on these type of team building camaraderie type of things? Do you think they're effective? You think it's something that this Sixers team could really use? Cause in my opinion, um, I think the leadership is really clear on this team and, I feel like Tobias and Joel can get pretty much anyone that will come into that locker room in the fold with all of the various tactics and ways that they, the group text that we've heard about, a uh, group chat, I should say, and the guys, you know, bonding that way and, and, and being purposeful with dinners and things like that. So I don't know if they actually need this. Maybe this is something that Doc Rivers really believes in and, and that's why it's being pushed. But where are you at on it, Noah? Yeah, I think it's, ultimately up to the head coach to know his team and understand what's the best environment for them. I think in most cases, it's not super impactful what you choose. Um, But I think overall, yeah, it makes sense to me uh, to just get away from any Philly related distractions. Obviously there are distractions wherever you go. Uh, And that was a buzzword last training camp when Ben Simmons wasn't there and the Philly media contingent uh, swarmed upon uh, the Sixers facility in Camden. But uh, yeah, I think most likely it'll play out nicely for the Sixers with guys getting to know each other better uh, and that environment, maybe just encouraging that a little bit more. Uh, We hear often from teams that the long road trips are really conducive to the team bonding and uh, you're sort of forced into those opportunities to get to know your teammates better on a personal level uh, getting some of that done early seems like a decent idea. I also don't have anything against teams who, you know, don't make these trips and stay local. I just think it's a preference thing and uh, the coach understanding what's best for his squad. But definitely Doc Rivers' history uh, going back to the Celtics days, I believe uh, he has really been a proponent for 
uh, this helping his team uh, just from a chemistry standpoint. And uh, the Sixers will hope that that carries over here. Obviously, the first couple of years here, it just wasn't really feasible because of the many COVID-related complications. Tyrese Maxey's first camp, he's uh, watching practice you know, afterwards and reviewing it with his assistant coaches because he can't be there because he has COVID. Uh, the Sixers hope uh, they do not have any of those sort of issues this time around. Uh, and they will be, be heading to Charleston and uh, it'll be fun to see uh, what exactly this camp looks like. You know, um, it, the nature of training camp, period, point blank, is this is a business trip. Hawaii and Europe seem less like a business trip, though, than going to the Citadel. Um, do you, are you drawing any significance from, like, the U.S. Army environment or the, you know, the rigidness or the soldier mentality? I mean, I guess there are some inferences to draw. Are you drawing anything from the location that they chose to have this training camp? I don't think it's unreasonable to do so. It's definitely something uh, Doc Rivers will be asked about, and I wouldn't be surprised if, that he has some uh, thoughtful reflection on how it will impact the king. Yeah, the yeah, team. I'm sure nothing was done uh, by coincidence. And, you know, this is an intentional location. And perhaps some of what you alluded to uh, is part of it. Um, yeah, it is interesting. Thing of Hawaii, um, I don't think that's where you usually associate, you know, just <laughs> finding a way. Uh, Hard that's, work, right? Yeah, yeah. That said, training camp these days, like, if we're being honest, it's not the biggest deal in the world with hours and hours of grueling on court work and guys getting into shape. That's not really the purpose. It's going over the X's and O's, getting guys on the same page who are new to the program and just starting to establish a culture uh, in a way that you want to play. Uh, so that stuff's valuable, but um, realistically, a lot of the getting into shape stuff should have happened already uh and these guys won't be doing you know miracle style wind sprints back and forth you know on a, on a military campus they're going to mostly be uh drilling basketball and walking through and just trying to uh start from a good spot this season just connecting the dots a little bit if they have five days on and one day off uh camp starts the 27th and ends october 2nd i'm going to assume the second will be that off day uh, because the third, they play their first preseason game. So from camp until playing that preseason game, I would anticipate probably a little bit of a lull uh, going into that a chance for guys to kind of recoup a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's not strenuous, so that I could be completely wrong about that. Yeah, I, would, I actually would not expect that, but who knows, maybe Doc Rivers will change things up. Uh, last year, I think it was they did the first three days and then they took one off mm -hmm. um, and then two uh, really – the idea of not having to practice before the preseason game wasn't on his mind because I think Joel Embiid didn't play the first preseason game. None of the guys were getting heavy minutes. So um, I think the goal was trying to make the practices as high quality as possible and not wanting fatigue to potentially compromise that by going five days straight. So we'll see what they do. I'd imagine they jam the rest day in the middle. Um, but it is a, is it a kind of a sharp turnaround where they're uh, going right from Charleston to – Barclays and that oh game, baby you know, oh baby atmosphere. yeah I think every single game against the Brooklyn Nets is circled on you know NBA fans calendars and perhaps they see Ben Simmons in that uh, preseason opener start college build skills and complete your degree with Wilmington University 100% online options and affordable tuition makes WilmU work for you Learn more at wilmu.edu. Noah, August 26, 1989, a star was born, and I'm not talking about Ben Barry. I'm talking about Mr. James Harden, the bearded wonder. Uh, we have seen the uh, social media circulation of these viral moments, and we will discuss a few of them. Um, he's turning 33. Uh, he uh, had a party on a yacht off the coast of California. Uh, Marina Del Rey, I believe, was the location. And uh, it was an all-white affair. Um, we did see uh, uh, Kevin Durant at the James Harden yacht party. We did not see Kyrie Irving make an appearance or any photos circulating uh, among the revelry. Um, 
I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, the overtures this offseason where that maybe Durant could find his way to Philly um, and you weren't quite sure how that relationship had ended exactly with him and Kevin and Kyrie. You heard a lot more about him and Kyrie not quite jiving with the one-on-ones and like some animosity that was created through there with Kyrie and him talking trash at each other and it getting a little personal. But Kevin Durant showing up at his yacht on the off season for his party kind of cements the idea that those two are still really good boys. And you have to believe that there was probably some discussion between them of the possibility of Durant landing on the 76ers, however informal it may have been. So um, it's interesting to see Harden take these steps uh, to continue to enjoy his off the court lifestyle, but we've continually seen footage of him also in the off season working extremely hard at getting back in shape and trying to heal up and things like that. Um, are you one that enjoys the yin and the yang of life, Noah, of the hard work, you know, work hard, play hard type of thing? I think I'm, I think I'm figuring that out as probably most of us are. I, I definitely, well, not many of you have seen Noah with the hardened beard. I've seen him with the hardened level beard, even better than James. So, so there, there are some similarities between Noah and James Harden. I wouldn't go that far, but uh, no, I mean, I think everyone kind of has their own personal understanding and preference on uh, how they balance their, their life and what they derive a joy from. So I'm not going to uh, complain or begrudge you know, him. Yeah. Have, have any, negative things to say about, you know, James Harden uh, having a good time on his birthday or, or any day for the year of the year for that matter, as long as it's obviously not, you know, directly impacting his basketball performance. So, uh, yeah, 33 is a big year. I guess it's the, the Larry Bird year. So yeah. uh, maybe James Harden will, you know, aspire to shoot, you know, closer to Larry Bird level um, <laughs> during his age 33 season. Um, but, yeah, obviously – it's a massive year for, for him in many ways, and uh, the expectations seem to be steadily rising as more of those videos you allude to uh, hit social media of Harden looking good and uh, working on his game. And in the theme of him looking good, working on his game, staying healthy, we see him it's seemingly throwing a whole birthday cake into the ocean. I, I, I don't know. The cake looked a little light to me. I don't, it looked like more of a prop than an actual cake did you did you did you feel like that that was something that gave you a chuckle noah we see little baby gifting uh him james is good him, him and james are good friends gifting them 250k um I, I gotta make sure i find you on my birthday noah so you can hook me up but what what, what did you think about all that stuff yeah i'm i'm a little curious what the whole cake throwing back story was whether it was entirely for the cameras or whether it was just a spontaneous moment of, nope, I don't want the cake anywhere near where I could grab a piece of it, perhaps. <laughs> or I'm anyone actually, else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It was, the cake was not, not on deck anymore. I, I'm reminded a little of uh, some of Gabe Kapler's uh, dietary <laughs> um, There was a clip that I saw of him just like talking about he doesn't really – subscribe to the notion of like you should kind of be pressured to eat and do certain things on your birthday, including eating cake. I believe the Giants staff or something made him like a steak cake to try to cater more to Kapler's dietary. All protein, baby. Yeah, not <laughs> not really a conventional cake guy. And I, I don't think he uh, partook on his birthday. I think he has this unusual philosophy of any day of the year, you should be able to choose to eat whatever you want. Uh, I'm on board with that. Although I think, of course, you know, the social norm would be if someone gives you a cake, you, know, you might want to try a little bite of it or at least not throw it overboard. Um, so I'm sure there's some sort of interesting backstory there. Um, but it was it was a fun, fun clip to see um, of James Harden. And um, yeah, he, he seemed to have a lot of those while also having a lot of the on-court clips as well uh, during his off-seasons. It's funny, a lot of people were remarking that with the big gift that he got from his friend, Lil Baby, that James was recouping some of the money that he gave up in his contract to make it more team-friendly, uh, you know, by his friend giving him a big hunk of cash like that. 
But, um, you know, I'm, I'm cool with all things cake, bro. I'm, I'm a huge fan of baked goods, so I love to eat cake, um, which, I, you know, is something as an adult. It's like you can go to a, the store and buy a whole cake, and no one is going to say anything, even if no one knows if it's your birthday or not. Mm -hmm. But as long as they ain't putting my face in the cake, like you see on so many of these birthday parties, uh, particularly in the Latino community and whatnot, um people just getting their face just smashed into a cake like that's that's the thing I, that party's over at that point I, I can't rock with that that's um that's probably a jarring experience i've never i've <laughs> never had that either i'm i'm grateful that's the case what you think um, you could be a good sport with something like that or yeah yeah as long okay. as it was it was all in good fun or part <laughs> of some sort of tradition i'd be okay with it i'm appreciative if if someone does something for me in a positive way on my birthday, I'm, I'm going to be appreciative of it. Um, but you know, I'm also not going to feel like I need to eat a huge chunk of cake either. I think I'm on the same page there with Gabe Kapler of, um, I'm going to be, you know, polite and appreciative, but you know, if I'm not feeling, you know, a thousand five hundred calories of cake, you know, maybe I <laughs> leave it and leave it in the fridge and, and have it later the next day or something. So, Everyone kind of has their own little little spin on how they approach their birthdays, and uh, James Harden's birthdays are are always a big event for sure. Bro, give me the cake. Fifteen seconds in the microwave, a scoop of ice cream. Leave me alone. Showtime. Okay. Woo! So are are you um, a like vanilla cake guy? Do you have a certain oh, type? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it depends. I'm definitely at first and foremost, I like the vanilla cake with the white icing. Um, my mom makes a crazy chocolate on chocolate cake that I, I can get down with. Um, with I'm, I'm not a huge chocolate. I don't like chocolate ice cream, but yeah, I, I, for birthday cake, I, I don't need, you know, the far reaching, you know, banana cream icing with the this and that in the middle. And I, I don't need all that stuff. I, you know, I, I like the basics and uh, just do the basics well. And then hit me with the ice cream, a little vanilla bean action. Showtime. But Sounds speaking good. of showtime. James Harden and all that he does, it kind of uh, brings to the forefront the question of the expectations for him this upcoming season. You know, uh, so many Sixers fans are hoping for a resurgence. They're hoping for the guy who we've seen go bananas, you know, shooting the basketball, scoring the basketball, uh, MVP level. In this, I guess this is kind of like his final act, you would say, these next few years, maybe 33 to 37. I, you know, I, I don't know if I can see him playing a, much past that, but who knows with the way things are going. But um, a guy like James who, you know, isn't built on explosiveness. He's not built on, you know, going above the rim or things like that. So he could extend his career past that point. But all that to say um, – the scenarios for what he brings to this team next season are pretty varied and we aren't sure what to expect. Do you feel like with what he brings to the table that he can be closer to pinnacle James Harden or do they even need him to be, you know, that uh, dynamic? And we talked about, you know, him raising his efficiency as kind of a baseline, but what's the best case scenario do you think for James next season? So I think a lot of it is most likely just contingent on what Tyrese Maxey can take on at a high level uh, as far as running and creating offense. Uh, I think we know Maxey, for a young player or for any player, is exceptional at not turning the ball over and being a safe decision maker. But if he can make that next step where he uh, – puts pressure on the defense a little more consistently, uh, kicks out to teammates and just shows a little more willingness to take reasonable risks as a playmaker and a passer, uh, then I think that alleviates the burden on James Harden a little bit to do everything uh, from a facilitating standpoint for the Sixers. So um, I think it just hinges on what you're expecting from Maxi. Um, I would expect him to make some progress in that general area, but uh, it's going to take time. He's only 21 years old, uh, and I think he is most natural as a downhill driver and you know someone creating his own shot as opposed to um, 
doing some of the point guard stuff that we all know Harden excels at. Uh, so, yeah, I think with James Harden, expectation-wise, I wouldn't be shocked if he has a few of those throwback games still left in the tank. Um, and I think with those big games, you know, part of it's just like rhythm and comfort with your teammates. But like some of it, it is easier when you're in good shape, as we we've, we've, you know, kind of focused on with him in the past. Um, and I don't think he was in horrible shape by any means for the Sixers last postseason. But you do look at the fourth quarters of those games in the Heat series, you're seeing jump, jumpers fall short. You're seeing difficulty separating off the dribble. Uh, so I think he enters this season with improved health, with the hamstring at or close to 100%. Uh, then the big games are a little more likely to materialize um, just because late, you know, when he's taken those step back jumpers, uh, the legs are fully under him and uh, he feels, you know, for a little while like he did when he was 27 years old as opposed to 33. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a tough one to put your finger on like numerically. I actually don't think there's that much variability in terms of him dropping off a cliff because he draws free throws so well and that does appear to be a skill that's going to be there for a long time and he's also such a great passer and teams should continue to feel it necessary to send bodies at him and give him opportunities to set up his teammates you know close to probably 10 times a game uh so yeah i think somewhere around you know a little over 20 points 10 assists that feels decent to for me to pencil in for James Harden. Uh, and then I think the shooting numbers are probably likely to rise slightly uh, provided he's healthy and does his part with uh, ensuring he's got gas left in the tank when the fourth quarter arrives. I think the most thing that intrigues me about the upcoming season, and I think you hit the nail on the head, like it's such uncharted waters for what you're going to expect from Harden. I kind of reflect back on his career and think about his OKC days. He was a sixth man. They were able to make it to the NBA Finals with him playing that role. They never quite got over the hump with Houston with him as the main um, ingredient. And then in Brooklyn, it just was a kerfuffle. The entire situation never panned out like, like it was expected to. So with the Sixers, he last year's success was was, you know, you know, a step below what he was able to do as the man in uh, Houston and the success they had as a group at OKC. But can he be what the Sixers need in order for them to take this next step? And I don't think the, I don't think he has to do much more than he did last year, but just make a few more baskets and, and be more of a leader uh, and, and connect you know, the dots with between him and Bede and Maxie. So by connecting the dots like that, I feel like that camaraderie that they couldn't build in this trip to the Citadel can be that, that thing that they need. Just more time together, more comfort. And with comfort comes confidence. And with confidence comes more shot making, more s smarter plays, you know, knowing your teammates better and things like that. So I, I think that there's kind of like a, uh, uh, three rivers that kind of need to meet. Like it, it all just needs to come together. And it looks like he's taking the steps necessary to do that. You know, cutting back on the weight, improving the hamstring and, and working with, you know, guys on the team in the off season, like we saw with, you know, him, Maxie and Sam Cassell. So I'm, I'm super optimistic that the Sixers team can be what they need to get over the hump and get to the Eastern conference finals, the NBA finals. Um, I don't think the window is very large for them to do that. I think they kind of have a couple of years here where it's either going to come together or fall apart. Um, so if, if when you look big picture with the team, is there someone on the team? Is it hard? Is it Embiid? Is there someone else who is kind of uh, the expectations and the pressure are the most on this person? Who is the person on the Sixers team with all that said about Harden and a bit we said about the other players. Who who are you looking at on the Sixers team where you feel like has the most to prove or has to bring the most? Yeah, I don't want to keep 
harping excessively on Harden, but I think it to me is it James for you? Okay, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, Joel Embiid, sure he has not gotten past the second round, and that's a big knock against him if you want to look at it that way. But it's been MVP runner-up back-to-back seasons, and I think everyone understands that a lot of the Sixers playoff disappointment has been beyond his control. Not all of it, but much of it. I think with James Harden, the legacy and just how do we look at his career sort of questions become more and more prominent as the end draws a little bit closer for him. So I think it, it absolutely has to be James Harden with the most to prove. Uh, we know he's a top 75 player. I think that was an uncomfortable. I think that's the thing for me that makes me feel like more of his legacy, obviously his better years are behind him, but he's a top 75 player, has the MVPs and the scoring titles where Embiid is still trying to claim those things and and match them up to the words and the pro- promises he's made himself. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I'm lean more Embiid, but p- just continue your thought, though. Yeah, I I guess I would say also James Harden, there's the reputation of his playoff failures and disappointments being more on his shoulders. Some of it being bad luck, as it is for everyone, but the last playoff game he appeared in, he didn't take a shot in the second half and he didn't get to the foul line all game. And then after the game, he said, the ball just didn't move to me and that was obviously a curious answer. So both with his you know, overall history and then his recent history, like the playoffs in James Harden, there is a major narrative there and the opportunities to shift that narrative or paint it in a more favorable light for himself are, are dwindling. And as you said, this on paper is a strong opportunity to go deep with this team and sure not be the number one star, but be a guy who, you know, bails them out when they need it in the fourth quarter and has this uh, partnership with Maxi where he helps the young guy to flourish and uh, supports him, you know, admirably as this veteran guy now. So I think there's a lot that James Harden can gain here, but you know, if he keeps petering out in the playoffs or, you know, has another bitter end to the season, uh, then I think that is really potentially going to cement the way people view him in, in a negative light. I think that there isn't much separation between the guy, three guys I think have the most to prove, but there is some separation. And one C would be uh, James Harden to me. He would be the third person I would think has the most to prove. 1A, 1B is kind of flip-flop, a toss-up to me between Embiid and Doc Rivers. And Embiid, for reasons I mentioned, I feel like Harden, he is, he has the the 75 jacket. He is of the MVP consideration. He's already considered, based on just our previous podcast at the very least, one of the top 10 players ever not to win a championship. So, some of those, yeah, I definitely, but I feel like, I, I feel I feel your points on, you know, the tough performances he's had as a member of the Rockets in the playoffs, close but not quite with the um, Oklahoma City Thunder. I just feel like as far as when, when people think back on his career, the subset of all of the glaring and, you know, you know, luminescent, uh, you know, uh, uh, MVP, scoring title, you know, the all NBA teams, the, you know, all-star selection. The subset of that is, well, he he wasn't quite money in the playoffs. Uh, He wasn't, um, you know, he couldn't get over the hump. I think that's a little bit more subset-wise, but this season can, and I, I agree with you, like I said, that this season can tell a tale about those things and change some of that narrative. But I feel like Embiid is still trying to capture, you know, the, some of those things. The scoring title was his, and that was incredible to watch. But there's still that defensive player of the year. There's still that, you know, um, MVP that he says that he wants, that he himself has lumped onto his own shoulders. So I feel like he will be 1B for me, pressure-wise, performance-wise, 
in the end, this is his team. Harden is just supposed to help, you know, push it along. I think Doc Rivers would have the hottest seat and most approved um, for, for so many various reasons and obvious reasons. But the thing I think jumps out the most to me is his um, sometimes indignant nature makes you feel like, well, what have you done for me lately? It's like, it's like defensively, he's keeping on to you, you know, uh, you know, would you ask pop that type of question? And, you know, I did it because that's what I was the right thing to do. So some of that indignance kind of like makes you feel defensive in a way you're like, well, you haven't won since, you know, you had the big three with the Celtics. So it kind of like puts the ball back in his court in my eyes. So I feel like he's the one who will bear the brunt of a slow start and have to be removed if the Sixers start slow or aren't performing up the task where Embiid and Harden can hide behind a little bit of that um, depending on how the season plays out. So I feel like Doc would be at the top of the list for me, then Embiid and then Hart. That's fair enough. Yeah, it's uh, obviously a subjective, highly subjective yeah. question. So um, I think championships, you know, dramatically change how people see you. And yes. this team wants to accomplish that, thinks it has a real shot. So if they do that, has a large impact on a large number of people and the stars and the head coach would be near the top of that list. Um, but yeah, it's not, not going to be easy. Just never is to get beyond the second round of the playoffs as the Sixers know very well. Uh, and yeah, I think we've gotten in a place with this team where the regular season just feels like it's less and less important than ever. Oh, oh isn't that? I, I don't like that feeling. I hate that feeling. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I enjoy, you know, the little unpredictable storylines that pop up each game and the unexpected um, the journey. A little bit more of the journey than mm-hmm. that necessarily yeah. destination. Yeah, team team finding its identity and unexpected guys, you know, rising to the occasion and all of that. But I think the expectation here is they they should improve upon their record from last season. They should top 50 wins. Uh, and really the focus is get the highest seed you possibly can set yourself up for playoff success, uh, which means health to the stars. It means everyone gelling and understanding their roles. Uh, and it means also, I think more importantly than ever having a nice draw in the playoffs and the Sixers uh, didn't get that done last year. I think the Miami heat were a difficult second round matchup. The Raptors were a tough round one opponent as well. Uh, so the idea should, you know, obviously is get that number one seed if, if you possibly can and start as, start as hot as you can. And we'll, we'll get rolling in Charleston. Charleston, September 27th is the day. We will bring you all of the questions, thoughts, uh, observations from September 26th, Sixers Media Day, before they leave for Charleston on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com and here on the Sixers Talk Podcast. we got to figure out if we're doing a live pod or if, we, if that's back, like we're post-pandemic now. Can we show up and do a pod like we've done in the past? But um, I think we could tie a bow on this show by going over – Ben Berry's top three cakes. This is top three. And uh, he reminded me of a couple here. Ooh, but but uh, number three, Funfetti. I'm a big Funfetti guy. You hit me with a Funfetti, Funfetti cupcake, or as uh, the kids say, party muffins. A little cupcake party muffin. Like the Funfetti is just such a surprise. You crack it open, and there's the little sprinkles all melted inside. It's fun. No? Noah? It's it's fun. It's it's not the most exhilarating thing ever to me, but uh, I don't begrudge you for enjoying a good Funfetti. I, I like baked goods, bro. I just love them. That's but fun. how about, is this exhilarating to you? Pineapple upside down cake. Bro, when it is done right, oh my gosh, it's just so melty and caramelized. Like I'm giving, I'm giving these descriptions and I'm like, I'm about to pass out here and your face isn't yeah. changing. No yeah, pineapple well, upside down I'm cake. Not a, I'm not a picky eater, but pineapple is one of the foods that I'm no. not a fan of. Get it away like, from you. Get it I away from me. I can definitely eat pineapple. I definitely understand the appeal, but it's not my <laughs> All right, so you don't like pineapple. His top ranking, go ahead. Do Number you like one. his top ranking carrot cake? 
His also, top ranking would have maybe been my top ranking as well. I, I enjoy a good carrot uh, cake immensely. So, uh, bro, sometimes they have that. these uh, individual wrapped carrot cakes in the gas station that they sell, like right at the counter. It's kind of like in the like little saran wrap, like right there. Sometimes mm-hmm. you know you just grab it while you're paying, and oh man, a nice little ride home treat. Come on, Noah. It's great. No, I think for a birthday sweet item, carrot cake. Uh, would be my number one, as as well as for Ben. I think if you're picking any sweet item, like a lemon pound would be a strong oh, uh, yeah, baby. with the yeah, carrot cake baby. for me. It, it, maybe it's like a little bit of a mood thing. You know, the carrot cake has some more of the complex flavors than the lemon pound. It's just pure and simple and extremely tasty. Oh, with the ice cream too. 10 mm-hmm. seconds in the microwave, hit it with the ice cream. You're, you're, you're curling your toes on that. You, you, you're licking your lips. Come on, Noah. All right. Um, it's, it's we good, appreciate yeah. you listening to the Sixers Talk podcast. Noah Levick is the man. Please follow him at Noah Levick on Twitter and Instagram. Check out his work on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. I'm Danny Pomelos for Ben Barry. We will see you next time. We're brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilmington Works. <laughs>